please, Mr. President. Uh, thank you all. Please have a seat, and thank you all for coming on a rainy day in Washington. Uh, it, uh, but it does not diminish the high energy in this room, and we're so glad that you can all come. And this is a, a very exciting day and an important day. Um, I think it was maybe nine months ago, six months ago, when we we hosted, uh, he was not quite President Odoir at the time, we hosted him on a telephone conference call. <laughs> he, uh, he called in, he was under duress, held up in a hotel room, uh, and, uh, but he was here with us virtually, and of course he ignited an excitement in the room and in Washington that still is here. And it's uh, thrilling really, to welcome him personally. And we're just so delighted that the President is with us. This has been a historic and monumental uh, trajectory for Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, not always certain, uh, but filled with hope. And today we are celebrating the hope. And it's wonderful that we have this opportunity. My name is John Hamry. I'm the President of CSIS. And we are fortunate to be the uh, one of the hosts, we are using our space, but we have four other colleagues uh, that are deeply involved in, the, in bringing the president here. I would like to especially say thank you to our friends at the National Democratic Institute, at the Center for American Progress, at the National Endowment for Democracy, and for Cote d'Ivoire Watch. These are important friends that have made this possible. We're delighted that you are all here, and we look forward to hearing from the president. I would like to turn this over now to uh, Jennifer Cook. She heads the Africa program, done a tremendous job with us, and her commitment to the success of this day and the success of your presidency coming to Washington is uh, un unparalleled. Jennifer, why don't you get us started for real? Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamry, and I just want to echo Dr. Hamry's um, uh, in welcoming you to CSIS uh, and our co-sponsoring institutions, which he listed. I also want to say a big thanks to Farha Tahir and the Africa Program team and others at CSIS um, for pulling this together and working so hard. Let me turn now briefly uh, to our guest of honor, President Alessandra Man Watara. You heard the, the cries of Ado out, out in the hallway there. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, on behalf of CSIS, um, we, we'd really like to welcome you warmly here to Washington, uh, this time in person. As uh, Dr. Hamry said last time, uh, it was just a big picture of you up here um, and your voice. Uh, it was a very tense and uncertain moment. Um, at that time, obviously, the priority was re to resolve that immediate electoral standoff. Um, resolution took, I think, a lot longer than many people anticipated. Uh, probably much longer than you would have wished. Um, but I think in retrospect that the forging of that strong international consensus on Cote d'Ivoire, the gradual layering on of regional and international pressures, uh, and ultimately the exhaustion of really every diplomatic uh, avenue before the resort to, to forceful resolution, I think that was very important um, in, in principle, in legitimation, um, and also I think uh, practically in averting what could have been, I think, a much more protracted uh, and uh, bloody confrontation. Uh, we should keep in mind that the Ivoirian crisis didn't begin with the election standoff, uh, nor did it end with the election standoff. Uh, social, economic, and political divisions uh, have long-standing roots. These divisions have deepened over time through economic decline, malgovernance, manipulation by self-serving elites, uh, and ultimately civil war. And the standoff and the post-election violence uh, that left 3,000 Ivoirians dead uh, have only served to deepen distrust and animosity. Uh, President Ouattara and his government face enormous challenges going forward uh, in reestablishing security, perhaps first and foremost, integrating demobilizing security forces, working with regional partners on, on uh, cross-border violence, the greatest challenge, though, I think will be that of reconciliation, uh, rebuilding trust, restoring confidence in the social compact uh, that binds citizens, communities, and the government to one another. Uh, rebuilding faith in a government that works transparently and accountably, accountably to serve the interests of the Ivorian people, that's going to be the work, I think, of many decades, in fact. Uh, more immediately, the questions of accountability and ending impunity for all those uh, involved in the political violence is going to be uh, paramount importance. Upcoming parliamentary elections, 
uh, are critically important in rebuilding truly national institutions that give Ivoirians a, a voice. And, and these elections are going to require the goodwill of, of Ivoirians of all political affiliation and the good faith effort, and I think the support and attention of international community as well. And finally, this major challenge of rebuilding security and trust at the local level uh, among communities and civilians that have really borne uh, the brunt of violence, economic hardship, and insecurity for so long now. Um, so there's a long list of priority challenges. Uh, interesting in the talk before, you're, al you're also thinking about the big opportunities ahead for Cote d'Ivoire, rebuilding regional relationships, regional economy, um, uh, rebuilding the Ivoirian economy, but integrated with, with uh, that much broader uh, strength of the region. So, Mr. President, we look forward to hearing from you on progress uh, and plans in addressing these challenges, opportunities ahead. We're honored to have you here, and I'd like to welcome you to the podium. Thanks very much. Well, actually, uh, Madam Jennifer made my work easy. You said everything, so <laughs> <laughs> I can move on to taking questions, actually. <laughs> well, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, of course, I, I remember it was in February, wasn't it, when you had me on a telephone uh, uh, conversation with, uh, with uh, people here. And it was a very tense uh, moment, as you said, because uh, we were had at the Gulf Hotel. Uh, and I remember the day before you called, my junior chief of staff told me that uh, there would be, we, we, we did not have food the previous day. And on that day, we should not have had electricity. <laughs> so finally, we got electricity and uh, we were able to, to move on uh, uh, to, to the discussion. Uh, well, uh, thanks all, and I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire has gone through very difficult times. I think not only over the past uh, six months of the post-electoral crisis, but uh, nearly for a decade, because uh, the country was under uh, uh, poor leadership, and unfortunately, we did not have uh, democratic elections in uh, 2000, and this led uh, uh, to a rebellion and uh, uh, to discussions which actually, uh, and agreements which were never uh, fully implemented until we finally got to the presidential election. And uh, then uh, we thought uh, things had uh, ended Unfortunately, the post-electoral crisis was worse. As uh, uh, Madame Cook said, uh, about uh, uh, 3,000 uh, people were killed, uh, a lot of destruction, uh, both in Abidjan and inside the country. Uh, so the, uh, the morale of the people uh, very low. Uh, and clearly, many people had fled the country, uh, refugees, uh, I've run a refugees, about 200,000 uh, in neighboring countries. Uh, for us, this was so painful because uh, uh, when I was prime minister, Scott Diwar was receiving refugees from Liberia. We had received half a million Liberian refugees, and uh, so it took a lot of money to feed them, to, to help them. And so, uh, in a way, uh, this, it's, uh, it was our turn. Uh, one million people were displaced uh, domestically, uh, especially in Abidjan, in specific districts uh, where you had a, a large concentration of people from the center and the north, uh, northern part of the country. Uh, so when uh, uh, President Babo was caught, uh, the uh, situation was uh, uh, quite uh, difficult because we needed to uh, install uh, security, uh, peace, uh, and at the same time we had to embark on reconciliation and, of course, reconstruction. Uh, and on the uh, 
getting security was took quite a bit of time. Uh, uh, the major reason was that uh, uh, when the uh, Force Nouvelle came to Abidjan, uh, the, in our view, uh, when we invited them in, we thought they would be coming for a week and then they would leave. But having uh, discovered Abidjan with the lights, the big streets, <laughs> and uh, the movie theaters, the maquis, the bars, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so they said, well, after all, <laughs> it will be a good thing to stay a few months. <laughs> and uh, so uh, getting them to return uh, to the northern part of the country has not been easy. And uh, an additional uh, problem was that the, uh, actually when they came uh, to Abidjan, uh, many people of the regular army uh, really did not want to fight for various reasons either. Uh, they did not share what Babo was doing or uh, they were afraid. So they just uh, uh, got uh, rid of their uh, uniform and boots and then went home. And the prison was broken and uh, so 6,000 prisoners left the uh, prisons and some of them, uh, many of them took the clothes of the military. Uh, uh, you have young people also in Abidjan, about 20,000 of them uh, got hold of uh, uh, guns and uniforms. Uh, so, so when you hear that uh, the Republican army is doing this or that, it's, it's not the army, but it's essentially uh, all these uh, uh, people who took uh, the uniforms. Uh, so getting to them to under control was not easy. But I think uh, now it's almost done. We have incidents here and there from time to time. Every morning, uh, uh, the Minister of Interior, the Prime Minister, gives me the number of uh, holdups or problems. Uh, so this morning, I was told that uh, we only had one holdup in Abidjan last night. So for a, for a city of six million people, so that's not too bad. I don't think you do that be better in Washington, no? <laughs> so it's to, so when uh, uh, different radios uh, talk about this, uh, of course, uh, it's helpful to us, and we try to see how we can improve uh, the situation. So now Abidjan is peaceful, the country is peaceful. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, removed the mercenaries and militias from uh, the Côte d'Ivoire, uh, but they're in Liberia. They're in Liberia and at the border. And this is a, a regional issue to us. Uh, we, have, uh, we had a meeting with uh, Sir Liv Johnson and uh, Jonathan uh, Atamil's uh, compaure and Wad uh, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, in Abuja to try to develop a, a system of uh, making sure that elections in Liberia would be peaceful and that uh, the mercenaries would be controlled. Uh, so, so on the security front, I think the border with Liberia is still a problem, but we're, we're dealing with it. Uh, the other element on security is uh, uh, with uh, uh, our, our neighbor, Ghana, where uh, a lot of uh, many refugees were, are from uh, former ministers, uh, former high-ranking uh, officials in the army or in the administration, and they uh, felt that they probably could organize uh, some type of rebellion from Ghana, but uh, uh, they probably did not realize that uh, Atta Mills is a very wise person, and, uh, and he has been uh, very cooperative. I think he's the president I talked most over the past uh, uh, four months. Uh, we talk to each other every week, twice a week, three times a week, and uh, uh, so he's been dealing with this uh, properly. He's the one who sent in uh, Cote d'Ivoire the members of the Constitutional Court to proceed with the swearing in, and uh, he encouraged many of the colonels, generals to return because he said that he would not allow a rebellion to be organized from Ghana. And so of course, he still has about 15,000 refugees in Ghana. So I'm going to, in fact, my uh, security minister is in Ghana today to prepare my visit there uh, next week. 
on October 6, I will be in Ghana to, to continue these discussions with President Tata Mills. So that always uh, leads to a question of reconciliation. Uh, we need uh, uh, to, to go forward with that. Uh, for me, this is important. Uh, I think my, uh, it's a priority. My uh, uh, responsibility uh, uh, is fully engaged. Uh, I think uh, in a society like uh, uh, that of Cote d'Ivoire, what the uh, president says is important. And that's why my, I've been uh, really preaching uh, reconciliation, uh, unity, solidarity. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is uh, uh, taking hold. Unfortunately, for 10 years or more, uh, uh, the other, uh, uh, the, the, my predecessor uh, really just uh, gave in uh, division, hatred, and this has been, uh, 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 had some impact, had some impact. Uh, so the process will be long, but we'll determine, and I believe we will get, uh, we will get there. Uh, the commission has been uh, uh, formed, uh, the members have been appointed. I can give you details in a few minutes if you're interested. And uh, we will uh, inaugurate the commission on September 28th uh, in Yamsokro. And uh, from there, they, they will start working formally, but they have been working uh, already. Now, uh, of course, you have uh, the Commission for Dialogue, Reconciliation, uh, Truth and Reconciliation, but at the same time, I tell uh, everyone that uh, the rule of law should be uh, uh, respected. Uh, you cannot have a country where you don't have justice and the rule of law. Uh, the trials have uh, been going on. Uh, those who have been uh, uh, found uh, guilty of been condemned, including uh, Laurent Babo and his wife uh, for uh, uh, corruption, for uh, what we call economic crimes. Uh, they have been indicted, so they should be in prison, but for uh, humanitarian reasons in consideration with uh, their uh, uh, previous uh, status and uh, for dignity of the functional president, uh, they're in a, they're, They've been uh, uh, in a have uh, lodged in a house, a comfortable house, both for them, and uh, so until uh, the process continues, because uh, for whatever concerns uh, 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 human crime, uh, assassinations, and so forth, we prefer uh, the ICC to deal with that. We don't know what the results will be. Because if we were to do it in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, I think it will create a lot of passion and uh, uh, it will be a passionate tr trial and it could divide further Ivorians. Uh, so I think uh, also whatever, if the result is to uh, get Babo uh, in jail, uh, uh, people will think it's not fair. So I prefer to have a transparent trial with the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, so this process is going on, and we do hope that uh, they'll accept to, to move ahead with that. Uh, on uh, uh, the question of balance or uh, impartiality, uh, this is obvious to me that uh, uh, no one uh, is above the law or unequal treatment is not acceptable. Uh, so uh, it will be uh, the justice is the same for all. Uh, we have uh, uh, disarmed many of the uh, uh, FRCE, uh, uh, the, the true ones that we have found. Uh, the military tribunal is dealing with them, and uh, so uh, there is no uh, problem. But what is difficult to, uh, to, to move on is some of the uh, uh, killings which have had a lot of publicity, like in the western part of the country in Jokwe, uh, where a hundred of people were killed, or in Yopugo. Uh, there, of course, uh, associations like Human Rights, Amnesty say, well, you have to, uh, to condemn uh, people of FRC, uh, 
uh, you have to condemn uh, this and that group. Uh, I have no problem with that. But uh, I think it would be unfair uh, to also uh, go on trial without knowing the facts. So that's why I've set up a national commission of inquiry uh, to look at all these issues. We have six months to, to do this. And they'll come with the results of the, uh, their investigation. And on that basis, uh, people who should face trial will face trial. And those who are uh, condemned will go to jail. So I wanted to assure you that uh, we're for uh, uh, justice uh, uh, free and fair for all as well. Uh, on the army, uh, we've m made a lot of progress. We've been able to integrate the two forces, uh, the new forces and, uh, and the regular army. But it's a lot of people, uh, so we have to go on with a demobilization program, which uh, costs a lot of money because Cote d'Ivoire, with 22 million people, cannot have an army of 60,000 people. So. So we need to cut it by half, and uh, so that means the other half have to be demobilized, and this costs money. So, but at least in terms of uh, hierarchy and the appointments, uh, I've been very, very vigilant and very uh, keen on making sure that when you have uh, number one from the new forces, the number two is from the regular army. Uh, this is the same in, uh, mar in the marine, in the uh, Air Force, uh, in the paramilitary, in the police, uh, all the way down. So we make sure that you have a balance, you have integration, and I think uh, this has worked well. They're working together. It's difficult because a few months ago they were fighting each other. Sometimes they, they fight each other during exercises in their barracks, but that's better than uh, having guns uh, to shoot at each other. So, so we're making progress there too. And uh, uh, finally, on the economic front, uh, the situation uh, has improved uh, uh, substantially. Uh, during my inauguration uh, in May, uh, the, the IMF mission had uh, uh, thought that the decline in GDP would have been uh, uh, close to 10%. Uh, uh, last week they said the projection is a decline of about 5%, but uh, most uh, importantly they uh, have a projection of, uh, uh, for next year, 2012, a projection of a growth of uh, 8 to 9%. So that's really a rebound, uh, which shows the efficiency of uh, uh, the economic management. Uh, uh, the, the, we have a, a very, very uh, early put up a social program uh, to help with uh, providing water, electricity, uh, medication, uh, free medicine to the poorest in the public uh, health centers, uh, uh, repairing roads. Uh, uh, we have started on large projects like building uh, uh, the third bridge, uh, starting highway programs. We, we ambition in having uh, a highway from Yamsokro to Ouagadougou, uh, uh, the railroad continuing on to, to Niger, uh, hydroelectric plant in Soubre in the western, western part of the country, a railroad to connect us with uh, uh, Guinea and Mali. Uh, so, so all these uh, projects will have an important impact uh, on the growth rate and uh, also on employment because uh, Employing uh, the youth is uh, a priority for us. Uh, the youth have been uh, manipulated by the previous regime uh, because of the lack of employment. Uh, uh, so we have to make sure that they're better educated and they get jobs. Uh, so, uh, Madame Cook, these are some of the elements I wanted to give you on the security, the military, and uh, the reconciliation and the economic front. On the diplomatic uh, uh, developments, we have uh, really embarked on an aggressive diplomacy uh, to get Cote d'Ivoire accepted by our neighbors because of the division within the country that we had, uh, the, the problems, the uh, violence. Uh, this touch on 
Africans who lived in Cote d'Ivoire, and you have about 20% of the population of Cote d'Ivoire uh, are from uh, uh, countries uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Mauritania. So, so the relationship with uh, the neighboring countries, it was quite tough, uh, tense and uh, mistrust. Uh, but we've worked very hard on that. <clears throat> I've visited uh, several countries, uh, Senegal, Burkina. My first official visit after inauguration was uh, in, uh, in Nigeria. And uh, next week, as I said, I'm going to Ghana. Thereafter, I'll be going to Mali and then to Togo, Benin, and so forth. So we want to, uh, and I have a state visit in France in May, December. In July, he, we were invited by President Obama and uh, have invitations uh, from uh, the serious several countries, uh, Lebanon, uh, Morocco, Israel, China. So, so we, we want to show that we're open to the world and that we, we want Cote d'Ivoire to play the role it played 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, Cote d'Ivoire was uh, not only at peace, it was preaching peace, and it was participating in getting peace to other countries and regions of the world. Uh, people forget sometimes the role we played during the time of apartheid. Cote uh, d'Ivoire finance uh, uh, gave scholarship to mo mostly all the young South Africans during the time of African, uh, apartheid. Uh, I saw that in uh, the files of the presidency, uh, uh, we, we paid hospital bills uh, for many of them uh, and so forth uh, during the time of apartheid. Uh, we played uh, an important role between Israel and Palestine. And so the country had uh, a prestige and a contribution 20, 30 years ago, which had disappeared. So our objective is to, to get Cote d'Ivoire uh, back uh, again. And uh, so would be counting on the U.S. and uh, all our friends to help us in this process. And uh, so I'm ready for your uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, Chris Ramunio, who is Director of African Programs at the National Democratic Institute, and together with Sophia Mustrup, who's kind of the mover and shaker behind this event, uh, is going to facilitate uh, and, and offer remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, um, for those very uh, enlightening and very informative uh, remarks. Uh, President uh, Watera has graciously accepted to take a few questions for the time that we have left. Uh, we don't have much time, but uh, we're going to try to accommodate as many people as we can. Uh, we will ask that you be very brief in your questions. Um, probably keep it to one question per person. Um, introduce yourself and your affiliation as well. Um, to set the ball rolling on this, Mr. President, I probably should ask the first question. Um, <laughs> take my opportunity before the audience takes it off. Uh, because I, I remember in early December when um, our country director, the NDI country director in Cote d'Ivoire and myself came to visit with you at the Gulf Hotel, um, and the crisis had just begun. And uh, we were very concerned about your, your personal safety, and we were worrying for you. But in that conversation, I was very struck by the fact that you didn't even think about yourself. Uh, all you talked to us about that evening was laying out your vision for Cote d'Ivoire um, and a very positive vision at that. And uh, I noticed that this morning in your remarks you laid out the same very positive message um, and you made it look so simple to have accomplished what you've accomplished in the past four months uh, in all of the sectors that you've listed. Security sector reform, the economy, uh, peace and reconciliation and uh, diplomacy on the continent and even beyond. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, what is it about you in, in person and about Ivorian society that gives you reason to be uh, very confident about the vision that you have for the country uh, based on what you've experienced in the past uh, four months of being in office?
Thank you. Well, I think um, uh, clearly I, I agree uh, uh, with all modesty that we have achieved a lot over the past uh, four months because the government was uh, put in place on July 1, on June 1, so that's uh, four months now. Uh, the basic uh, tribute is really to the Ivorian people because uh, after so much suffering, the violence could have continued. But what I, I discovered, well, not discovered, but I was confirmed in my, uh, uh, my, my, my uh, vision that Ivorians are peaceful people. And that uh, really uh, the lack of uh, peace, the uh, birth of violence uh, uh, was uh, something uh, intolerable. And once this came, people got back to work, really. I think uh, I was told that uh, when my predecessor was in office, people used to go to work between 10 and 11. And that today you have uh, 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 roadblocks at around 7, 7.30, because everyone knows the president goes to work at 7 o'clock, at 7.30. <laughs> so, so people are really happy to, to, to be at work and to be working. And we've had also, of course, a lot of support from uh, our friends from the international community. Uh, uh, so so uh, basically, uh, it's important for each one of us to think that uh, for a limited period, you can have the uh, honor to make a contribution to your country. I tell my staff here, especially these two young people uh, sitting there, CD and Masere, that uh, my philosophy is that uh, every day, uh, sometimes they even very, very young, they tell me, President, you work too hard. I said, well, you know, my philosophy is that every day I work as if it will be my last day of work. And uh, in my uh, uh, thinking, uh, if this term is the term in which I want uh, to put Cote d'Ivoire back on track. So the rest is not very important. So I think it's work, 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 and work. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. President. We'll take two questions at a time. And we'll start with the middle role, and I see uh, Bernadette has the hand up. Thank you. My name is Bernadette Paolo, and I'm from the Africa Society and a member of Cote d'Ivoire Watch. I want to add my congratulations to that of everyone in this audience for all that you've achieved in the past four months. My question goes to the heart of the uh, statement that you made about security and its correlation with investment. Um, I would just like to know if all the foreign entities who were previously in Cote d'Ivoire have resumed their operations at full tilt and whether the call that you have made when you were in the United States now, your second time, to the United States, investors in the United States, if you're seeing some response to that call and opening up new sectors with new investors. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, Dave, did I see your hand up? Okay. We're very proud to have supported the work of NDI and many uh, civil society organizations uh, for human rights and democracy in, in Cote d'Ivoire. I uh, have a fairly simple question, I think. Uh, could you comment on the concept of Iwarite, uh, the role it played in the Ivorian crisis and uh, its future? Thank you, David. Uh, Mr. President, you respond yes, to those I two before we take two more. These two, yes. Well, first, uh, on the security and development, actually this morning I had uh, the opportunity to deliver a speech on um, uh, security and economic development at uh, uh, the, the think tank uh, of uh, the Congressional Black Caucus. And uh, I appealed to the American companies to, to, to come to invest in Cote d'Ivoire. And I think many have, uh, have returned. Uh, uh, of course, in the oil field, uh, in mining. In fact, uh, I met uh, uh, one uh, uh, 
chairman of a big company. Uh, they were having a lot of problems before for, for various reasons, corruption, uh, ideology, and were part of uh, the previous regime and the like, uh, suspicion. But I think now the, the, they realize that the, the, the government officials are uh, completely available uh, and at work. So I'm confident that more companies will be coming. Uh, also in the agricultural sector, we had a uh, representative of uh, big chocolate companies. Uh, we're going to meet this afternoon, uh, Secretary of Labor, to talk about this uh, problem of child labor, uh, to, to indicate that these are problems of the past, so we should uh, look at the progress we're making in tackling these issues. So I'm confident uh, on the private sector side of the U.S. involvement, the problem is uh, because of various reasons and uh, problems. Uh, the contribution of, uh, of the U.S. government, uh, uh, but of course, the contribution was uh, immense in terms of diplomacy, uh, politics, uh, uh, support. Uh, uh, President Obama talked to me twice during this crisis, uh, and uh, his ambassador came to see us uh, at the Gulf Hotel uh, two, three times a week, uh, sometimes by road, sometimes by air, sometimes by boat. <laughs> he used all means to be really very close to us and uh, supportive. Uh, but on the financial side, um, uh, the, the amounts have been small. Uh, I think uh, there is an amount on HIV, uh, 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 fighting HIV, and, uh, which has been enlarged a bit. Uh, from 100 million to 130 million. But we're hoping with uh, the admission eligibility of Cote d'Ivoire on AGOA and also on, uh, on the MCC that uh, the U.S. will have uh, an important uh, uh, contribution financially. Uh, obviously, the U.S. is a member of uh, the IMF, World Bank, uh, African Development Bank. I know they have given very positive messages to these institutions, uh, and they have been helping. Uh, the IMF has uh, moved very fast, the World Bank also, the African Development Bank. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, we'd like the U.S. Uh, we thank the U.S. for what is being done, but of course we would like them to do more, we'd like them to do more. But the private sector is coming very big, and uh, we're very happy about that. Now, on the question of citizenship, Again, this morning I addressed this issue. It's a fundamental issue in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, as I said, about 20% uh, of uh, people living in Cote d'Ivoire uh, are from other African countries. Uh, uh, so that's uh, 5 million people, uh, uh, 5 million other Africans. Uh, and. Uh, Many of them don't know any other country. They have never gone to, uh, to Mali or to Burkina or to Senegal or to Mauritania. And so during the previous regime, uh, uh, the, the problem of uh, division among Ivorians really slapped over them, splashed over them. And uh, uh, so we need to address uh, uh, the citizenship question. And uh, we hope to have uh, parliamentary elections on December 11th. So I hope next year in Parliament we'll have a debate on this issue and uh, try to, to take experience of what is being done elsewhere, especially in the United States. Because if someone is, uh, someone's father and grandfather have been in Cote d'Ivoire since the 19th century, I don't know, I've never gone anywhere else, does not know any other country. Uh, and continuing to treat that person as a foreigner is completely stupid in my view. But I cannot be the only one to decide. I, I do think uh, it's important to, to review this matter and also to have a consensus on it because uh, uh, there have been such a, <coughs> a misuse uh, uh, of this concept that uh, uh, it, it brings fear among citizens, which is not good. Because in the western part of the country, uh, sometimes if someone is from the center of Cote d'Ivoire, they consider that that person is a foreigner. 
or if, it, uh, if it's uh, on the north, that's even farther, then he's, he's really a foreigner in their mind. So we have to really address these issues, and uh, we have to do it squarely. And uh, once we have that behind us, I mentioned earlier that this will also uh, be a solution to the land issue, which is very important. Land, uh, obviously, ownership uh, uh, depends on citizenship. So once we can address these two issues in the next uh, years, uh, Cote d'Ivoire will be uh, a very, very uh, peaceful place, in my view, because these were the, the reasons of, uh, of the turmoil and, uh, and the violence. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, let me take uh, the lady right here on the third row. Excellence, vous êtes le bienvenu. Ado. <laughs> Uh, my name is Deirdre Le Pen. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania um, and uh, visited Cote d'Ivoire very frequently many years ago. Um, you mentioned youth and unemployment and the uh, need to pay attention to the demobilized youth in particular. Uh, this, of course, is an issue in many parts of Africa and Cote d'Ivoire may offer some examples to other countries. I wondered if you had been thinking about developing any particular strategies or programs to meet this challenge. Thank you, Deirdre. Anyone else from the left? Okay, uh, Vivian Derek, right here. Good, good afternoon. My name is uh, Vivian Lowry Derrick, Cote d'Ivoire Watch, which is a project of the Bridges Institute. First of all, just thank you so much, Mr. President, for coming and meeting with civil society because it's truly an acknowledgement of the partnership that we feel with Cote d'Ivoire. Um, secondly, I want to thank you for the leadership that you are modeling in post-conflict situation such as um, Cote d'Ivoire. My question is, again, one of security, particularly in the southwestern part of the country. Um, we were all disheartened by the, the recent deaths there. And the Liberian election is coming up in almost three weeks in October. So I'm wondering what the specific um, thoughts that you have on how to really ameliorate the situation in that area. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much. And uh, youth unemployment, uh, I think this is a crucial issue because uh, the youth uh, have been manipulated uh, uh, into violence. And uh, in fact, uh, the universities were closed uh, uh, for several years, both in the north and the south. And as a result, uh, really, uh, the quality of uh, of training of education is very poor. Uh, so even uh, when companies uh, try to recruit, uh, they, they do see that uh, there is need for uh, additional training before they can even employ the, the young people. Uh, we, we have uh, in our program, uh, the, we have objectives, we have targets, but that's not enough. We have to have specific projects which will be used uh, to, to, to absorb unemployment, youth unemployment. And these are some of the major projects now uh, for being implemented uh, uh, in uh, the question of having a, a clean city in Abidjan and elsewhere. Uh, this has a, a lot of uh, employment impact. Uh, uh, the third bridge, uh, the highways, uh, so these are uh, major projects. But we have to make also the life in the agricultural sector more attractive. Uh, this will help in uh, getting people to uh, 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 stay in their regions, uh, especially the cocoa rice uh, production areas. Uh, uh, and in that, we have um, decided for, to restructure the country into uh, uh, 12 major uh, districts. 
Uh, now we had, I uh, don't know how many regions and so far 50 or so. Uh, but we want to, we have, uh, last week we had a, a, a ministerial meeting to look at this. And the, the, the objective is to have a big, a major project in each of, of these uh, so-called district super regions. Uh, which will uh, create employments, uh, and uh, then each region will have a university, uh, will have a hospital, uh, so the population will uh, be uh, uh, attracted to, to remain in that region because they have the same opportunities as coming to Abidjan. As I said, the, the young soldiers, when they arrived in Abidjan, they did not want to go back to their region. So uh, this will cost uh, quite a lot of money on top of the demobilization efforts, which uh, is certainly something important for everyone. Uh, but we're working on this. Uh, we have to have uh, a full package. I've asked the prime minister to uh, do the annualization of uh, some of these major projects for us to know how much it will cost, the time the, the lag for implementation, the amount of cre employment creation, what proportion uh, for, for young, uh, for the youth employment, uh, what proportion for women employment, and so forth. So we do take this seriously, and uh, so, so I'm, I'm confident that we will not be able to do everything we want, but we certainly have a strategy. We have um, a regional uh, distribution, and uh, uh, so we'll see uh, after two, three years what we have achieved. Now, on the question of security, uh, yes, um, the, the, you know, the problems of security, of insecurity, started actually in Liberia uh, 20, 25 years ago. And then from Liberia, it spread to other countries, uh, to, to Sierra Leone, to Guinea, then to Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, now that you've had uh, democratic elections um, in Sierra Leone, in Guinea, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, and that the mercenaries uh, have been pushed out of Cote d'Ivoire, they will return to Liberia for most of them. And so this is, uh, uh, we were quite worried about this. And we met uh, uh, with the other head of states under the leadership of President Jonathan of Nigeria on September 10th in, um, in Abuja uh, to uh, work on a, a scheme of uh, protecting the electoral process in Liberia. The elections are uh, scheduled for October 11. Uh, so we have, we're providing police and paramilitary surveillance of the elections. Uh, uh, for example, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, volunteer, Cote d'Ivoire is providing the largest contingent. We're providing uh, uh, 280 paramilitary, 140 police, uh, so that's 320. Uh, Nigeria is providing uh, uh, 280, uh, Ghana 300. So, so all the countries I've uh, mentioned are really uh, in to uh, make sure that uh, these elections are not only transparent and fair, but that they're peaceful, especially when the results come out. We will not tolerate any uh, uh, type of uh, situation as in Cote d'Ivoire from either side. I think we made that clear. Uh, and uh, now, on top of that, Cote d'Ivoire has a specific problem. It's a border with Liberia. The border is 780 kilometers long. I think that's, what, 500 uh, miles. Uh, so, uh, and it's a, an area of dense forest. Uh, so the mercenaries, uh, sometimes they come into Cote d'Ivoire, they kill people, and then they disappear into the forest. Uh, so this requires a lot of uh, investment in uh, uh, trucks, in uh, motor bikes, uh, uh, of course, in all types of uh, uh, devices to track them. And I've just talked to the Secretary General of the UN uh, yesterday and said that uh, for this emergency plan for three months, 
we need $40 million, which we did not have in our budget. Uh, so clearly, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very costly. But since you have uh, October, you have the election in uh, Liberia, December 11 in Cote d'Ivoire, we need to be particularly uh, uh, present during these three months. And Nigeria also will send troops. So when we make a total package of this, we'll see how various countries can help us uh, for the financing. So uh, obviously, Madam Derek, I count on your, <laughs> your influence to, to, to really tell uh, President Obama and others that we need this support quickly. Uh, you know, if you don't have security, you will not have stability. And uh, now, if uh, these uh, four countries of the Mano River are able to, to get democratic governments to have security and stability, uh, it will make uh, quite a difference in West Africa because uh, the four countries are quite, uh, have a lot of potential in uh, whether in agriculture, in mining, uh, hydroelectric plant, uh, iron ore, and so forth. So, so we're working very hard to, to get all the benefits of, uh, of these natural resources. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. And we realize the president has got a very tight schedule. Um, but if you don't mind, we yeah. probably can take one or yes. two. Yeah. Uh, yes, well, two questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, we, we, we're going to take two questions. I see uh, Professor Tungara here and the gentleman on the third row, and then one Ivorian, Mr. President. She's Ivorian. Okay, so we have three questions, and that will be it for today. So, Professor Tungara. Yes, we'll come to you. Okay. Good morning, Mr. President, and congratulations, and thank you for coming. Uh, Jenny Tungara, Howard University, and uh, Cote d'Ivoire Watch. Um, my question has to do with uh, education. I, you didn't mention um, educational reform uh, in your initial remarks. Uh, I'd like to know if it's business as usual for the universities, for the uh, secondary school systems and, and primary, or is there something new underway? Uh, what is the new curriculum going to look like um, in order to create the, the peaceful country that we want going forward? And what opportunities will we have, certainly, to engage with Ivorian educators? And um, I don't know if you know it, but there have been a lot of, uh, of initiatives from the White House, uh, bilateral initiatives, uh, that are leading to a great deal of exchange between uh, US universities and countries abroad, China and Brazil, an example. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Pascal Fletcher. I work for Reuters News Agency. I understand the cocoa harvest this year was a particularly a major factor, a successful cocoa harvest in uh, the rebound of growth of, of, of Cote d'Ivoire, but uh, it's been a, a sector that's uh, been under some criticism in the last few years. And I just wonder if you could very briefly outline what you propose for that sector in terms of reform and, and restructuring. I understand there is a plan, and if you could give us some detail on that, uh, I'd, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal, and uh, the lady right here, second row, yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Kadi Touré from U.S. West Africa Group. I just want to make a brief statement. So we do one more question left, please. Okay, my question was uh, months ago when you organized your forum on the Congress, it was during a very tough moment, uncertainty. I just want to say today we very pleased to see the president to congratulate him and also to see very proud of his achievements. I'm from Cote d'Ivoire. Thank you. So one more question. Well, I, I think we can use this opportunity to... Oh, okay. The president has graciously accepted to take your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watra. He was my former boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I will congratulate you, sir, for winning the elections, and congratulate you even more for being the president. I have two questions. One, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Please. Okay. 
one, okay, one question, okay. Um, this, will have, this question will have to do with the uh, uh, original question, sir. Uh, what do you think of the, uh, being from Guinea, I have to ask the question. What do you think of the accusations that uh, uh, President Conde just labeled on Senegal and the Gambia? Is this type of accusation condu con conducive to stabilization in the region? Um, isn't this a return to the Secuture era where dangerously um, poisoned the relationship between Guinea and its neighbors? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, on the question of uh, Madame Tungara on the education reform, uh, no, you know, this is really a, a, big, uh, a, a big sector for us, as I said, because uh, the system has completely collapsed. Uh, the, the difficulty in Cote d'Ivoire, as you know, as you is that the university was used uh, as a center of uh, political strategy for the former regime, both the professors and the students. Uh, and uh, really, um, uh, it's, it's a total disaster. Uh, now, what we have done, we have dealt with some of the uh, uh, high landmarks of uh, this, the former regime, uh, for example, La Sorbonne, which was a place where, uh, you know, students, uh, people who had been students uh, repeating and uh, uh, the same class 10 times, <laughs> and they'll go and give speeches and so forth. Uh, uh, really, uh, or uh, we closed the university, the, the the campus because uh, some students had been on the campus for 15 years. They did not have their bachelor degree and they had formed a syndicate and they used to uh, really uh, confiscate rooms, uh, boardrooms, I mean um, bedrooms of the students uh, and uh, sublet it to people outside who were not students. All types of, uh, of things. So we closed the, the, the campuses in my program, I have uh, the, uh, promised the construction of five universities in five years. But before that, what I told the Minister of Education and the Minister of uh, uh, Higher Education is to really get uh, a proper uh, strategy of educational reform. Uh, they're working on it, and uh, clearly it's a priority, but we will, cannot open the universities until we know what we want to do for the future. We'll be very, we're being criticized for not opening the universities and so forth, but uh, my position is that we have to take stock, we have to know what we have to want to repair, and then uh, we will uh, implement our strategy. So I can tell you this is a, a priority for us. Uh, now, and uh, if you're willing to come and help us, I'll be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> now, on the uh, cocoa sector reform, uh, well, I'd like not to really uh, go into this because it's uh, one of the points of conditionality uh, for the uh, debt relief. Uh, uh, so so we, uh, I think uh, uh, clearly... Uh, we will have to, uh, to liberalize the, the whole system, sector. We'll have to give more to the farmers. We'll have to give access to all in buying cocoa and so forth. So I want to go into all these technical issues here. Uh, but uh, come to Cote d'Ivoire in a month and you'll have all the details because uh, the prime minister is chairing uh, uh, a cocoa sector reform. Uh, we have to do this by October, I hope, end October, uh, for so that uh, the IMF board and the IMF, the World Bank uh, board can examine our uh, uh, credit request uh, in November. Uh, so for um, uh, the question about uh, the regional uh, the accusation by uh, my friend and brother, Alpha Conde, you know, you can, uh, you, you, 
you work for me, so you can, uh, you, you, you know my answer, it's a domestic question, it's, uh, I don't want to intervene with uh, domestic affairs in Guinea, uh, but I've been talking to Alpha, I can tell you, but uh, he's a good friend and I can tell him what I think of this type of, uh, of uh, position. Uh, we all want Guinea to really do what we are doing, reconciliation, and uh, really the building of a nation. And it's important to concentrate on that. I think that should be the priority. So thank you very much. Your Excellency, in fact, uh, what you see here is um, just a fraction of the people who really wanted to listen to you this morning. Uh, we had to move this uh, event a couple of times uh, to find a room that could accommodate everybody. Uh, and we're really delighted that despite the, the, rainy, uh, the rains, everybody is showed up. Uh, we would like to use this opportunity to thank you for making the time to visit with all of us. Uh, and probably also to extract from you uh, a commitment that the next time you're in Washington, uh, you will be, you'll make time to, to meet with as many people as possible because uh, people are interested in your career, in your performance, and also in developments in Cote d'Ivoire and the future of the Ivorian people. Uh, so on behalf of uh, my colleagues at NDI and also our sister organizations that co-sponsored this event, uh, Cote d'Ivoire Watch, which is a, a, a coalition of uh, civil society organizations, uh, the Center for American Progress, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, and of course, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. We want to thank you profusely for giving us this time. We thank everybody for coming, and please I'll ask that you join me in uh, thanking the President one more time for his very eloquent presentation. <laughs> But uh, I cannot. Uh, <laughs> no, I think uh, Chris and Jennifer uh, thought this would be the last word. It's not. Uh, the last uh, word of thank should come from me <laughs> because uh, NDI uh, has been really a uh, 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 home for me. Uh, with Ken Wallock. I don't see what Ken, where did he go? He left. <laughs> <laughs> he knew that I was going to speak about him. So uh, Jennifer, uh, Chris, uh, uh, Ken, and of course, uh, uh, Madam uh, Albright, uh, I really am very, very grateful to you because you gave us visibility, uh, you gave us advice, and you gave us support. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Please, we'll ask that you remain seated uh, while we escort our honored guest uh, out of